Few movies are able to truly call themselves punk. Sure, some have gotten the aesthetic qualities of the movement right, but hardly any of them carry its spirit. Instead of using it to make rebellious political commentary or show how hollow and corporatized the world had become, producers just saw aggression. It was only when the scene had transitioned to Southern California that a recent UCLA graduate from England seized the opportunity to not only give punks the on-screen representation that they deserved, but also to make a film that perfectly mirrored the core ideologies of punk itself. Welcome to Criterion Retrospective. My name is Magnus, and today we're going to be talking about spy number 654, Repo Man. Alex Cox is a certified weirdo in the world of independent cinema. While some of his work can easily be classified as masterful, others not so much. But that sort of comes with the territory of being an experimental filmmaker, something which Cox most certainly is. He began his academic career as a law student at Oxford, but then decided that it wasn't really his thing and left to study film at the University of Bristol. The problem was that the English film industry had taken a huge hit as funding from the United States had become extremely scarce in the wake of the Hollywood Renaissance. Of course, the country did produce quite a few hits during this time, but Cox's chances of making it in this particular market were much slimmer than if he were working in America. So, after graduating in 1977, he packed his bags and moved to Los Angeles, where he enrolled in UCLA's film school. For nearly three years, he worked on his student thesis, Edge City, also known as Sleep is for Sissies. While the basic plot follows an English writer trying to get his big break, it's almost incomprehensible beyond that point. When Cox finished compiling his footage together, he realized how banal the story was. So, he curbed the 55-minute short down to roughly 36 minutes to purposely make it more confusing, in theory adding a bit of intrigue to the sequence of events. In a way, I really appreciate this approach. He nearly hit feature length, but instead of trying to add more uninspired footage to the runtime, he took what he liked and turned Edge City into a breakneck experience with a distinct style. In Edge City, we can find a number of traits that would become staples of his feature film career. Among those traits are heavy drug use, a respect for punk music, repossession, a subtle commentary on Western society, and a fascination with Central American revolutionaries. After the film was released, Cox was contacted by a number of producers to write scripts for them, but all of these projects fell by the wayside because of both creative and scheduling conflicts. It was during this time that the punk scene had come to Southern California. Punk in California was something of a reaction to the hippie scene of the late 60s and early 70s. In response, hardcore punk was created, the absolute antithesis of peace and goodwill. Cox was enchanted by both the music and its followers, although he never considered himself to be a part of the movement, merely an academic observer, although his passion had begun to seep into his artistic process. In his attempts to draft and auction an original script, punk culture had become a central tenet of his writings. He later reflected on this by acknowledging that there weren't that many films that gave punk an honest depiction. The only big film to showcase punk music was Rock and Roll High School, a comedy that featured the Ramones in extremely prominent roles. That was the late 70s. Even though it had only been a couple of years since its release, the sonic landscape of the genre had shifted immensely, and the film didn't represent the core values of punk, those values generally being anti-authoritarianism, do-it-yourself grassroots ethic, and of course, non-conformity. There were obvious attempts to portray these values since the story follows the students of a high school overthrowing their teachers, but it was all done in a very light-hearted manner. Rock and Roll High School was, after all, a comedy. Something that Cox couldn't get his mind off of was how politics were shaping the lives of these people even though half of them weren't consciously aware of it. The germ of a film was growing, and it would grow even bigger after Cox apprenticed under his neighbor Mark Lewis as a repossession agent. These agents work for third-party corporations that take back products that haven't been completely paid off, with the main product being automobiles. There was something so rigidly anti-punk about repoing. On one hand, you could be busting down on someone that refuses to pony up the dough to complete the payment. But on the other, some of these people are simply unable to pay, whether it be poverty, having money locked up in something else like school, or simple ignorance of the credit system. Cox was inspired and began writing the initial draft of Repo Man after using associate Dick Rude's unutilized script for Leather Rubbernecks as the backbone for the story. Around the same time, he bumped into some old friends from UCLA, Jonathan Wax and Peter McCarthy. They had started a small production company in Venice that began with the intention to shoot feature films, but slowly regressed to commercials and pickups for larger projects. After a lengthy discussion about Cox's new script, Wax and McCarthy had re found their love of film. The three decided to partner up, and after signing on their old teacher Rob Rosen, they formed Edge City Productions, an obvious homage to the film that started the director on his path. 
To try and capture investors with the edgy punk vibe of Repo Man, Cox packaged a four-page comic zine with the script. Several elements of this comic, such as its critique of capitalist society along with its zany art style, drew in Michael Nesmith, formerly of the farce rock band The Monkees. This wouldn't be his first foray into independent cinema either, as he had just come off of producing and writing Time Writer. He found that Cox obviously had a vision for his film, and decided to be mainly hands-off in regards to the creative aspects of the project, instead acting as a liaison between Edge City and Universal Pictures. Bob Ream gave Repo Man the green light, but his involvement with the project had been cut short by a corporate restructuring, and the new acting partners were far less generous to Cox and company. While they were insured a budget of $1.8 the new deal stipulated that the film would have to be made on a negative pickup, meaning that the budget would come after the film was completely made and ready to be put in theaters. The new Universal clearly didn't have as much faith as Ream did, but Cox didn't falter and began to assemble a production team. The main character Otto was to be played by Dick Rude, the friend that gave his script to Cox. However, the casting department brought in up-and-coming actor Emilio Estevez to read for the part, and Rude was quickly replaced. He was still given a very prominent part as Duke, but he expressed his obvious disappointment in losing his starring role. The titular Repo Man was envisioned as Dennis Hopper, but during the writing process he had built up a reputation for his erratic behavior on set, and Cox felt that this would have inhibited production. So instead, he took up a suggestion from his wife to cast Harry Dean Stanton, a prolific character actor who had been in some of the greatest films of both the Hollywood Renaissance and the emerging blockbuster era. To name a few, he's had significant roles in Cool Hand Luke, Two Lane Blacktop, The Godfather Part II, Alien, and Escape from New York. He had never taken a starring role before, and thought that the material was unlike anything he had ever seen in a motion picture. Of course, his version of the script had been updated with the sci-fi leanings that would be instrumental in bringing out the zaniness found later in the film. Cox also contacted several LA punk bands including Black Flag, Suicidal Tendencies, and Circle Jerks to contribute music to the soundtrack. He felt that it was important to get a variety of musicians from different sects of the genre to add authenticity to his version of L.A. So, hardcore acts would be heard diegetically, Latino rockabilly band The Plugs would perform the score, and punk legend Iggy Pop was asked to write the theme. Iggy, in particular, was at a rough point in his life due to years of constant drug abuse. He has since cited Repo Man as the turning point in his life where he began to clean up his act and started to record music again, believing the opportunity was a gift from God to express himself. Things were looking good, but just like the intense and unstable nature of the music that inspired the film, production wasn't as smooth as Cox wanted it. However, this led to the creation of one of the most interesting, chaotic, and thought-provoking pieces of political science fiction to ever hit the silver screen, and by nature of its subject matter, the punk scene itself. It was during the summer of 2015 that I had found myself enamored with obscure cult sci-fi films like Videodrome and Liquid Sky, yet somehow the holy grail of this genre had eluded me. My dad was actually fortunate enough to have seen Repo Man in theaters, but hadn't seen it since, and I figured why not give it a try? It's on Criterion after all. This cover combines all three of the central story elements into one image. The skeleton is an allusion to the vaporizations caused by the Malibu, the spiky hairstyle represents the punk edge, and the markings around them are a map of Los Angeles. Also, Harry Dean is hidden on top of the case. The Digipack insert is even better as it's covered in little details found throughout the story. The art style is much akin to what are generally found on zines, do-it-yourself low-circulation fan magazines that usually focus on topics that are far outside the mainstream. I actually had the opportunity of making a zine as a project for a class, and I can attest to the strange punk-like qualities of the medium. Basically, the art is beautiful and totally representative of the subject matter. The inside of the case displays a variety of posters that take inspiration from some of the more prominent one-liners. The disc is perfect given the the strange bland product placement in the world of the film, something which I will cover in greater depth later on, and this booklet is loaded with content that I'd consider pretty essential if you'd like to know the context of the strange existence of Repo Man. The essay by Sam McFeeters clarifies the punk scene during that time. Alex Cox's illustrated production history is a great way of visualizing the messy creative process, and Mark Lewis's interview adds a layer of authenticity to the scenes of repossession. The supplements include an audio commentary with Alex Cox and several crew members of the film, interviews with the actors, an interview with Iggy Pop and his emotional attachment to his title song, deleted scenes with Samuel Cohen, a roundtable discussion with the producers, a conversation with Harry Dean Stanton, and of course, the trailers. This Blu-ray is a 2K transfer and I got it as a birthday present from my parents. They're smart shoppers, so they ended up getting it for $20 on Amazon. This is one of Criterion's most robust and accurate physical releases. All of that being said, besides the transfer quality, almost everything on here has been lifted from the 2011 Eureka Masters of Cinema Blu-ray. It's not really a complaint given the much better presentation on this release, but they are very similar, just something that I thought I should point out. Repo Man came out in early 1984 and tanked. 
After Bob Ream had been replaced at Universal, the new regime wanted to burn anything that he had a hand in. The film received very little marketing and was pulled from theaters after just one week. However, two things occurred that would give it a second chance that almost no other film has ever gotten. The first was a glowing review by prominent film critic Roger Ebert, who absolutely loved it. While he noted its flaws, he recognized that Cox had a personality and aesthetic unlike anyone else out there. And crucially, the film drew him into the punk subculture, seeing it as much more than what he was led on to believe. The second was the runaway success of the soundtrack album. It sold nearly 50,000 copies, and stores had to request more just to keep up with demand. After listening to the likes of Fear, Burning Sensations, and Black Flag, people were jonesing to see what the soundtrack actually played to. Both the art crowd and kids across America were invested, and Universal had no choice but to release it again. It became a huge hit for a low-budget sci-fi film, making nearly 4 million over its budget of 1.8. It has since been grouped with other legendary cult films such as Eraserhead and Rocky Horror Picture Show. It runs for 92 minutes and has an aspect ratio of 178 to 1, meaning that the image should fill the screen on most monitors. So what is Repo Man all about? Well, Otto, a young suburban LA punk, finds himself down on his luck when he meets Bud, a repossession agent that tricks him into pulling a repo. After Otto realizes that his life as a punk hasn't amounted to much, he decides to take up a job as an agent and enters a life of drugs, guns, gang violence, and radioactive Chevy Malibus. Repo Man is, in essence, a ton of genres thrown into a blender. Alex Cox initially thought that his film would be done in the style of a Roger Corman B-movie, but miraculously, each one of what I would consider its four central genres reinforces the other in such a way that it cannot be considered lowbrow. Instead, it acts as something of an art film that masquerades under the guise of an unsophisticated popcorn flick. It is at once a comedy, a crime thriller, a political drama, and a science fiction film. While it's not like these genres haven't been paired together, it hasn't been done as fluidly as it's been done here. Best of all, Cox was able to turn a simplistic concept into a very layered commentary on society, but more on that in a minute. The general story follows Otto, Emilio Estevez's young punk, as he decides to distance himself from the cliques he associates with. In doing this, he comes to terms with his distant personality, begins to build a bit of a professional career under the tutelage of the Helping Hand Acceptance Corporation, maintain a steady relationship, and work toward the future. At first, Otto finds himself entranced by the high-tension lifestyle of his fellow repo men, finding enjoyment in the excess of the job. They're allowed to steal cars, live a fast life with drugs, drink on the job, and work as many hours as they need. It's only when a $20,000 contract for a 1964 Chevy Malibu goes out that Otto's steady world begins to deteriorate. Harry Dean Stanton's bud takes Otto under his wing and teaches him everything that he knows, making sure that his pupil follows the rules of the job to a T, those rules being, don't mess with the contents of a car, never damage a car to get into it, and most importantly, don't get killed over a car. That's why he immediately disregards the contract for the Malibu as he assumes that it must be associated with something recklessly dangerous for such a high price. Earlier, we are shown exactly why this car is such a hot item. Professor J. Frank Parnell is pulled over in the desert for speeding, but the officer ends up being more concerned about the noises coming from the trunk. That seems familiar for some reason. Oh right, Cox lifted it directly from Kiss Me Deadly. Later, when Otto meets Layla while on the job, she reveals that she's hiding from federal agents because of her knowledge about the true nature of the Malibu. Supposedly, it's housing two decomposing alien carcasses that still emit an intense amount of radiation that will only grow as they decay. She even gives Otto a picture to prove it. <laughs> looks, like, looks like sausage. It's sausage, Otto. That's a picture of four dead aliens. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that would be exactly my reaction too. The picture is actually of two water-filled condoms dressed in grass hula skirts. This adds an element of shifting deception as the audience is left to assume what the Malibu actually is. By the end, it's pretty safe to assume that it's becoming a vehicular nuclear bomb, but that isn't necessarily the case. Again, more on that later. As the film progresses, the Repo Men get further tangled in a web of lies, jealousy, and denial as the feds start tracking down the Malibu. This leads to Otto's uncertainty in his career, Bud's uncertainty in his entire life, and the further despondency of downtown LA. After a heated chase and several changes of hand, Bud ends up behind the wheel of a now glowing Malibu. After an argument over who gets the contract money, the cops roll in and gun down Bud while the area is secured. Everyone and anyone comes to the lot to try and approach the Malibu, but they are either burned or repelled in their attempts. That is until Repo Man Miller comes from out of the shadows to reveal that he is one of the aliens. He motions for Otto to come to the Malibu. It ascends, and then drives off to the stars. That is Repo Man at its most very, very, very basic. For a 92 minute long movie, you wouldn't think that there would be as much content as I'm about to dive into. This is one of the reasons why it appeals to me so much. It's relatively short and to the point, funny, narratively engaging, and absolutely packed with political commentary and off-screen events that impact the overall story in ways that most other films haven't even attempted. Starting at its most basic elements, the story is driven by its characters and not necessarily the events. The first half hour of the film does a really great job of setting up Otto is our main character. I feel just as lost as he does. When we first meet him, he's been fired from his job, cheated on by his girlfriend, and financially backstabbed by his parents. As he gets used to his life as a repo man, we see him open up a lot more. We get a sense that the only reason he joined the punk movement was because of his status as an outsider, trying to break into a popular new wave while in principle going against one of its most essential concepts, nonconformity. Every one of Otto's gestures is awkward in the best way. Whenever he tries to explain his emotions properly, it seems as though he's genuinely tongue-tied and nervous. He's a disaffected youth that's trying to make sense of a nonsensical environment. This contrasts well with his apprenticeship under Bud, a self-proclaimed veteran of living in the seedy underworld of the city. In several scenes, we hear him speak of his ironclad plans for the future. He's got spotless credit, some very stable income, and ideas of running his own repo business when he gets too old to do it himself. Harry Dean Stanton is one of the few true geniuses of his field, and the way that he understands his characters and explicates on the material that he's given is both impressive and absorbing. Cox later admitted that much of his dialogue was either ad-libbed or incorporated several different scenes into one succinct monologue. Several of his musings also end up producing some of the most memorable quotes of the film. I never broke into a car, I never hot-wired a car, kid. I never broke into a trunk. I shall not cause harm to any vehicle nor the personal contents thereof, nor through inaction let that vehicle or the personal contents thereof come to harm. It's what I call the repo code, kid. Don't forget it, etch it in your brain. Not many people got a code to live by anymore. Hey, look, look at that. Look at those assholes over there. Ordinary fucking people, I hate them. Uh, me too. What do you know, kid? See, an ordinary person spends his life avoiding tense situations. Repo man spends his life getting into tense situations. Along with the motif of Otto's wardrobe becoming less and less punk, we see Bud straying further away from his own advice. The life of a repo man is fraught with tension and conflict is inevitable, but he makes it very clear that he has no reason to carry a gun. In fact, he dresses like a detective to make it seem like he's more dangerous than he is. He doesn't want to be dangerous, he wants to seem dangerous. That's why it's a little strange when we get to this shootout scene where he actually has a gun. At first, I thought this was an oversight, but after watching him devolve into an irrational, destitute pest Pessimist, it sort of makes sense. We see him frequently lament the rampant gentrification and homelessness in LA, saying that this was not the place he was promised when he was younger. He's stuck in the past and he's trying to catch up to the violent world around him, which makes it all that more painful when he doesn't pull the trigger. In the end, their positions are flipped. Otto tries to persuade Bud to get out of the car and listen to reason, demonstrating that he now has something of a handle on his present situation. He's at the stage where he's the one making demands. Throughout the film, we see Otto react rather submissively whenever something happens to him. By showing that he has the volition to affect the outcome of a situation, it proves that he's taken up Bud's advice and is now living in the present. The difference between them is that Otto isn't looking in the rearview mirror like his partner. Instead, he now looks to the future and throws all caution to the wind when Miller persuades him to get into the car. It's a really funky character arc and it leaves a surprising emotional impact. The supporting characters are just as interesting 
interesting. If they aren't strongly built with complex backstories or dynamic personalities, they're at least memorable and entertaining. Light, another Repo Man, is essentially the exact opposite of Bud, and he disregards the Repo Code entirely. He'll break into cars, mess about with their contents, and even carry a gun on the job. Or so we think. When a repo goes wrong, Light steps in to save the day, only for Otto to ridicule him for firing into a house blindly. Jesus Christ! Hey, blanks get the job done too. It's a really interesting way to show how people can live their lives differently, but at the end of the day, they are left with the same result. Just like Bud, Light doesn't want to hurt people either. He wants to be imposing and seem dangerous. However, I feel that this was rather coincidental, as this scene was written with Bud in mind. Harry Dean had developed quite the temper during production because of Cox's specific direction. During a scene where Stanton swings a wooden bat at one of the Rodriguez brothers, Cox took it away from him after he nearly destroyed a camera. Stanton felt like his acting style was at odds with his director, and Lion Cox for making decisions he deemed amateur. Still, it's interesting that this split the character into two halves. One just ends up being more developed than the other. Layla starts as a quirky love interest that helps to move the plot forward with her knowledge of the Malibu, but she too demonstrates an arc that a lot of the other characters experience. When she's captured by Agent Rogers, she's given the opportunity to communicate with the alien contact in cooperation with the feds at the cost of personally torturing Otto, playing on her desires by forcing her to make a decision. This could very much be seen as a micro Cosm of how corporations and governments work. Someone is going to be negatively affected in the pursuit of a larger goal, and Layla's commitments to her extraterrestrial observation group overrides her relationship with Otto. Kevin is the prototypical Napoleon Dynamite. That's not even hyperbole, just look at how the dude dresses and acts. J. Frank Parnell is one of the wackiest mad scientists ever put to film, Duke makes for an adorable punk wannabe, and Miller is straight up odd. We should actually talk about him for a second because only later does he become important to the plot. He's built up as this eccentric hippie-like guru capable of revealing life's greatest secrets while looking crazy on the outset. His presence isn't even of that much importance, but he adds an extra layer to the insanity of some scenes. That's why it's both shocking and yet understandable when he reveals himself to be an alien. Speaking of which, I have a theory as to the events of the story because it's sort of left up to audience interpretation. Keep in mind, this isn't the hard truth, this is just how I saw the film in my head. In the amazing opening title sequence, we actually see Parnell depart from Los Alamos to Los Angeles. For those that aren't aware, Los Alamos is the site where the first nuclear bomb was developed, and there has been constant speculation that military bases all across New Mexico house extraterrestrial specimens. My theory is that the Malibu itself is a spacecraft that had been locked up in one such base where it had been carefully preserved. I think that a nuclear motor is housed in the trunk, and it would explain why people get vaporized whenever they open it. After the scientists have messed with it, whatever was shielding the occupants from the radiation had been broken, as evidenced by the exponential green glow the car emits. Layla is revealed to be a part of the United Fruitcake Outlet, a group that observes alien activities that has connections with someone that knows what the Malibu truly houses. I think that Miller might have given her fake pictures of the aliens in the trunk in an attempt to have someone lure the car to LA. This makes sense because Miller has shown that he doesn't know how to properly work technology and doesn't immediately reveal himself in the climactic lot scene. I also believe that J. Frank Parnell might be an alien as well. He reveals that he got a lobotomy, something that sounds right in line with what the US government would probably do if they got their hands on a live alien. He explains that the stress of his job in developing the neutron bomb forced him into getting one, which further made me question if he was tasked with arming the Malibu. He knows about Layla and is actively trying to find her. I don't know if he would have known about Miller, but it seems that his mission is to get the Malibu to the alien so the humans can can't mess with it. It's crazy how many times I've shown this film to friends, and yet we can never come to a clear conclusion. Hell, some of them don't even come to a conclusion because they're laughing so hard. It's difficult to deny just how funny this movie is. As I mentioned before, Repo Man is a goldmine of fantastic one-liners. Still on the job, white boy. Get in the car. What about our relationship? Fuck that. Come on, Duke. Let's go do those crimes. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, let's go get sushi and, and not pay. It happens sometimes. People just explode. Natural causes. Free my ass. What are you, fucking commie? Huh? No, I ain't no commie. Oh, you better not be. I don't want no commies in my car. No Christians either. Oh, dookie wookie hurt his little hand. Fuck you, Archie. Just for that, you're not in the gang anymore. What do you want? You want to make 10 bucks? Fuck you, queer. John Wayne was a fag. Don't care how long it takes, dildos! Repo man's got all night, every night! I know a life of crime led me to this sorry fate. 
and yet I, I blame society. Society made me what I am. That's bullshit. Even when jokes aren't flying left and right, the characters are consistently engaging, and yet what makes the humor really shine through is what Miller describes as the lattice of coincidence. A lot of people don't realize what's really going on. They view life as a bunch of unconnected incidents and things. They don't realize that there's this, like, lattice of coincidence that lays on top of everything. I'll give you an example, I'll show you what I mean. Suppose you're thinking about a plate of shrimp. Suddenly somebody will say, like, plate or shrimp or plate of shrimp, out of the blue, no explanation. No point in looking for one either. It's all part of a cosmic unconsciousness. This explanation later becomes part of the joke when we see an advertisement for a plate of shrimp in the background of this scene. This happens constantly. One of my favorites is a connection that takes a really long time to be referenced. In the beginning, Otto silences Kevin for singing the 7-Up jingle. Feeling 7-Up, I'm feeling 7-Up. Feeling 7-Up, I'm feeling 7-Up. It's a crisp, refreshing feeling. Crystal clear and light. America's drinking 7-Up, and it sure feels right. Feeling lucky 7. Kevin, stop singing, seven, man. Seven. Huh? What's a singing guy? I'm standing right next to you and you're fucking singing. Cut it out. Later, when Otto is beaten up in a botched repo, his co-workers want to know who did it, so he directs them to the manager that fired him. Listen really carefully to the background. Mr. Humphreys? Yes. Yes, I'm Mr. Humphreys. What do you want? <gasps> yeah! I know it's hard to hear, but the commercial playing on his TV is 4-7-Up, and it's using the exact same jingle. And I just found out while editing that that's Kevin in the background. If that weren't enough, there are tons of weird subliminal gags like all of the repo men being named after beers and the lettered agent's name spelling out best. There's an astounding amount of creativity in the details, and yet the majority of the central story is made up of elements found in Kiss Me Deadly. Cox has admitted his love for the classic and sees his film as something of an expansion of the concepts that Robert Aldrich brought to the table. The two have incredibly similar qualities despite their dissimilar presentations. They both have flashy yet functional opening title sequences, a story built on character interaction, use of the hidden parts of LA, and a nuclear MacGuffin that eventually eclipses the plot. So much is the same, and yet Repo Man remains wholly original, and that might have something to do with Cox's greater interest in the world that he was building. When watching Repo Man, one can instantly feel that something is off. Even though most people can't exactly pinpoint what that something is, the film feels like its version of Los Angeles is completely separate from our own. And that's exactly the point. Repo Man is set in an ultra-conservative dystopia. In the early 80s, American politics were rocked with the election of Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States. A staunch conservative, he implemented several policies that cut down on federal spending, cracked down on domestic crime, and took up an active role in trying to end the Cold War. I personally found him charming and struck me as a man that very much did care about his country, although it's impossible to overlook the byproducts of his choices. In implementing what would be known as Reaganomics or trickle-down economics, he helped to decrease inflation and strengthen international commerce. But this ended up harming the working class pretty significantly since the money was flowing more toward the big companies and away from the workers. In his attempts to topple communism once and for all, he had become pretty hands-off with his own leadership, which made it much easier for politicians within his own administration to commit illegal acts such as the infamous Iran-Contra scandal. As if that weren't bad enough, his excessive spending in the war on drugs and beefing up the military led to an increased crime rate and unforeseen economic ramifications. For conservatives, it was pretty easy to give him a pass because of his intense pride in pushing the nation forward. But for everyone else, Reagan's presidency was marked by innumerable blunders and unforgivable actions. Looking from the outside in as a foreigner, Alex Cox thought that Reagan was a parody of a politician. It seemed that he was going against his own party's stance by completely completely screwing people over with his emphasis on federal rights. Cox wasn't alone. Much of the punk movement at the time had less than kind words to throw his way, and several bands including Dead Kennedys and Wasted Youth built their name off of their dissatisfaction with the president. One of the bigger concerns that Cox had was with the nuclear arms race with Russia that Reagan purposely escalated by stockpiling more missiles as the decade rolled on. It was insane to him that an entire country elected in a man that wanted to strong-arm peace through aggression. This too had seeped into his writing, and eventually the entire world of 
Repo Man became a portrait of Cox's worst fears. For a film set in Los Angeles, arguably one of the most recognizable cities in the world, you wouldn't necessarily know it if it weren't for a few scant shots of the downtown skyscrapers. Instead, most of the locations are comprised of urban decay, gentrified neighborhoods, and underground nightclubs. This implies that the city is spread beyond its current reach, and we are seeing parts of it that don't actually exist. Or at the very least, haven't been filmed because of their less than glamorous appeal. It's also interesting to note the use of diegetic sound in regards to music. The Plug's rockabilly surf score is very reminiscent of what was found in Pulp Fiction films of the 50s, but the actual songs heard by the characters are almost entirely punk. Whenever a different style of music is heard, it's usually associated with the dystopia itself, such as when we hear light jazz in the Superstore and spirituals when Otto's parents are watching their televangelist program. Both of these complexes have a huge influence on the events, even though we don't necessarily see the effects until later on. The Superstore ends up having further reach than when the story starts, as evidenced by the generic food items seen throughout the film. To avoid any licensing troubles, the producers contacted several stores in the area to see if they had anything that didn't have a huge marketing presence. California chain Ralph's grocery stores were cycling through their inventory and were preparing to get rid of their expired stock when they were approached by Jonathan Wax and Peter McCarthy. After speaking with the general manager of one of the LA locations, they won him over with the idea for Cox's script and ended up donating as many expired products as the production needed. In the end, the small Christmas tree air fresheners became the film's sole product placement and they can be found in almost every car. The oddly ubiquitous blue striped foods added to the overall narrative in ways that Cox hadn't expected. Perhaps it was by accident, but I think that it makes for a pretty convincing case showing how corporations are slowly taking over small businesses. Otto and Bud frequent a number of convenience stores. Toward the beginning, the products are mostly name brand, but as the city becomes more and more dystopic, we see the blue striped foods make their way to the shelves of these stores. It's a small detail, but it totally works given the themes that Repo Man builds itself on. The televangelist program acts as something of an extension of the government. Most politicians that describe themselves as religious fall on the right side of the aisle, and this show ends up influencing a number of people as the film rolls on. Otto's parents become so absorbed by the sermon that they end up donating all of their son's travel funds to a church in Central America. However, the money probably never went in that direction, as the program is revealed to be just as greedy as everyone else. When the contract for the Malibu begins spreading around town, we can hear Reverend Larry say this, Clearly a lie, this proves that it's all just a ruse. I'm not gonna stand on some soapbox and lambast religious expression as a whole. After all, religion can be quite beautiful and rewarding, but that's not to say that people haven't been tricked in the past to commit some pretty heinous deeds because someone of the same faith told them to do it. During the 80s and 90s, there were numerous witch hunts against things that were deemed culturally destructive or inappropriate, and often religious stations such as the one shown in the film would rally people together as one uniform mind. If the church saw it as unfit, so did society. Last but certainly not least, there appears to be an election happening off-screen that is leading to the further degradation of the city. Of course, we only get to see the posters flying off the sides of buildings while people are sick and dying in the streets. But this imagery strikes me as one of the most brazen critiques of capitalism that I've ever seen. It suggests that the people at the top only care about the little guys for their votes. After they go to the polls, they're essentially nothing to a big politician and perish away due to their negligence. In the finale, we see all three of these concepts slamming together. Repo leader Ollie walks onto the lot with a six-pack of generic beer, Reverend Larry fails in his attempts to approach the Malibu, and government agents are fried left and right. If the film were to only focus on capitalist complexes without a compelling story, it would get very tedious and preachy. But instead, the majority of Cox's commentary is left to be noticed in the background. The problem is that a lot of emphasis now lies on the apparent, and unfortunately, not everything in focus is as beautiful as you'd think. Something that Cox hadn't expected when writing the script for Repo Man were the numerous intrusive measures taken by his corporate overlords at Universal. Like any budding filmmaker, he wrote the story to be big and daring. This was rather unfortunate considering how little faith his distributors had even in just the concept. They never received the full version of the script, and as such, Michael Nesmith had to step in a few times and regretfully tell his team that a few changes had to be made. This affected him negatively as well since the majority of the budget was coming directly from his own pockets, as Universal stipulated that the film had to be made on a negative pickup. This didn't mesh well with Cox's dynamic and shifting creative process. Start to finish, he had envisioned at least three different endings, but whenever Nesmith made his routine reports to the publisher, they didn't like what they were seeing. The original ending had Otto driving the Malibu to Central 
Central America where he would become a revolutionary, threatening to use his car to wipe out the United States if they didn't listen to his demands. There are artifacts of this storyline still in the final product. In this scene, not only are the Rodriguez brothers shown to be stockpiling arms, but Marlene, the receptionist of the Helping Hand Acceptance Corporation, appears to be friends with them. This was to be the setup for Otto's allegiance to the revolutionary cause. There are numerous references to the Contra Wars playing on the TVs in the film, foreshadowing what was to come. Marlene would eventually persuade him into joining them after getting his hands on the car in place of the lot scene, where they would then use it to threaten the government. Universal didn't like this. They immediately asked for a rewrite and a reshoot, but Cox felt that he could keep the footage that he had already shot and simply write around this change. The Malibu would become so dangerous that when the trunk was open for a third and final time, LA would go up in a mushroom cloud. Again, more elements of this plotline are found across the film. J. Frank Parnell's radiation poisoning and the growing glow of the car became essential story elements and make up some of the most crucial scenes. Again, Universal found that this too was straight up inappropriate and fear-mongering, later stating that Cox hadn't changed the function of his original ending. You have to remember that the idea of nuclear warfare was still looming over the United States because of Reagan's escalation of the Cold War. So finally, Cox threw in the towel and relied on his alien MacGuffin as the crux of the story. These changes ended up fragmenting the film in some pretty harmful ways. There are very large stretches where the narrative completely drops off. This is fine towards the beginning since we are being introduced to the world of the film, but later on the pace becomes staggeringly slow. Having seen the deleted scenes, there were quite a few that connected moments of character development to the plot in a much more seamless manner, but I understand why they were cut in the end. Cox went with what he felt were better performances and not necessarily better scenarios. This gives Repo Man the great comedic edge it's known for at the sacrifice of fluid continuity, and it shows. There are a number of unmotivated cuts that make the individual scenes feel like vignettes that are woven together with a loose narrative. Some of these are funny, others can be pretty jarring. The most glaring issue with this choice is that it lessens the audience's investment in the outcome of the story, but since it remains thoroughly enjoyable throughout, this isn't that much of a concern. At least not to me. In a way, that's kind of this film's motto. Things look and feel so wrong, but end up working to its advantage. Take, for instance, Robbie Mueller's photography. Mueller remains one of my favorite cinematographers of all time, and his stripped-back approach to lighting and movement has come to define Vim Vender's early works, as well as the gritty atmosphere of Jim Jarmusch's future films. The issue is that this style is totally different than what Cox wanted. Mueller felt that there was more of a cerebral appeal and simplicity, but Cox wanted big, explosive cinematography to capture the action of his set pieces. Much like his issues with Harry Dean Stanton, Cox would have to compromise yet again as Mueller's style won out. The two would end up battling for where the camera was positioned, something that absolutely infuriated Mueller. He liked to do everything in long master shots, a usually distant shot that gets everyone in frame at once and completely opted out of doing inserts altogether. Rather hilariously, Jonathan Wax came to Cox's side and asked Mueller why he wasn't getting coverage from another angle, to which he stated that this was the one position for the camera and that's going to be it. Wax thought on this for a second and asked if a spot across the street could also also work as the one spot. Without hesitation, Mueller said it would work. So now the team had some leverage as to where the camera would be placed, balancing Mueller's minimalist taste with Cox's grand vision. In a way, it equals out the crazier aspects of the film and allows the viewer to take in the scene with greater appreciation for the fine details. Though some of those details aren't quite up to snuff. The special effects are admirable at their best and straight up cheesy at their worst. That being said, it's cool to see just how creative the team got with these effects, as most of them can be replicated on the cheap. Speaking of the cheapest effects, when Otto approaches the lot for the climactic finale, the Malibu is apparently affecting the weather and is now causing large hail to storm on the city. This hail is actually just a bunch of ice cubes that crew members sprinkled from above the camera. Interestingly enough, there's a good bit of animation in this film. The now iconic vaporizations are comprised of two shots. The first has an actor stand in front of the trunk while the frame freezes, and a graphic of a skeleton is placed on top of his body. The second is a simple cut where the actor is no longer in frame. The trunk itself is filled with lights and a heavy fog machine which gives off a brilliant glow. While the overall effect is sort of silly and simple, it's a fantastic way of creating tension as several characters come close to opening the trunk. Later in the film when the Malibu begins to emit electricity, a technique similar to Emperor Palpatine's force lightning in Return of the Jedi was used. People simply acted as though they were being shocked and a coil of electricity was drawn in later. It's honestly some pretty cool animation. However, this rolling green blob over the car is simply atrocious. They had to draw over the car itself since it was in motion. During the lot scene, most of the mise-en-scene remained stationary, which provided an opportunity for a much more convincing effect. The car was covered in green 3M reflective paint, which produces a great shine when a light is cast on it. Later when the car flies, it's simply being pulled upward by a crane arm and a steel cable that was matted out. Because of the small budget, there are obvious limitations as to what can be represented. But since 
everything is aesthetically uniform, the lesser presentation adds more to the character of the film than it takes away. And that is Repo Man's greatest strength. At a time where most films with a heavy political bent were taking themselves with the utmost sincerity, it's refreshing to see something that holds itself in such an irreverent light. That's not to say that Repo Man doesn't have a heart, in fact that's one of the best things about it. What I mean to say is that the commentary we are being presented with is infused into the narrative itself, and instead of talking down to his audience, Cox was using the current political climate to make a story that is both relatable and yet weird enough for us to remember, even decades later. There are inherent structural flaws, but when the comedy and characters are are as good as they are, it's not something to worry about. And because those elements are so deeply tied to the subject that Cox is critiquing, it ends up creating a film that has a personality that has never been properly replicated and most likely never will. This is one of my absolute favorite films, and you really need to witness it as one holistic piece. So go get it. Or I'll go fucking nuclear. Hooray! I'm really happy to have done this one. Like I said, this is an all-time favorite, and I can't see myself not watching it in the future. As always, a like and subscribe push me a long way, and if you're feeling generous, you can donate to my Patreon, where you can receive exclusive content and be credited as a producer on my future videos. Links to my social media and everything else is in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Magnus Prophecy, and I'll see you guys later. Have a good one.